Good morning, Mr. Zarmour. <clears throat> Good morning, Ellen Lazarmour for the Commonwealth. Anita Russo, who wrote the Commonwealth's brief for Essex County, is with me at council table. I will be arguing for Worcester County as an assistant district attorney and for Essex County as a special assistant district attorney. These cases are the Commonwealth's appeals from two orders, one issued in Worcester County and one in Essex County dismissing the Commonwealth's petitions to commit the respondents as sexually dangerous persons under Chapter 123A. In both cases, the respondents were transferred from prison to Bridgewater State Hospital during the pendency of their criminal terms under Chapter 123, Section 18. The Department of Correction then later obtained their further commitments under 123, Section 7 and 8 when their criminal terms expired. Sometime later, Department of Corrections staff notified the district attorneys of the respondents' imminent release, and the 123A petitions were filed. In dismissing the petitions, both judges essentially concluded that the Commonwealth could not seek the commitment of the respondents while they were not serving criminal sentences. Or and after their sentences had been served. After yes. their sentences had been served and while they were no longer serving any sentence while they were no longer serving their criminal terms, despite what? that they were confined to Bridgewater State Hospital, uh -oh. and also determined that the respondents were not prisoners within the meaning of Chapter 123A. Well, well that's the heart of it, isn't it? Construing that statute, which, at least according to the judge's memo, Judge Wexler, I think his name is, um, speaks so much in terms of being an actual prisoner. Uses the word prisoner, talks about uh, you know, uses terminology of if you're in prison, that kind of thing. Um, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. All the references in the key portions of the statute to in, more or less to incarceration. How can we fix that? Isn't that for the legislature? Well, Your Honor, it's the Commonwealth's position that both the language and purpose of the statute do support the Commonwealth's construction that the Commonwealth could appropriately seek commitment while the respondents were confined to Bridgewater State Hospital. The so Chapter 123A allows for the commitment of respondents who are incarcerated, confined, or committed to DYS for whatever reason if certain standards are met. Under any definition, the respondents here were certainly confined to Bridgewater State no, Hospital. I, I understand that. I think, the I think there are a couple of concerns. One is the language that Justice Graney has pointed to, which is the mm. prisoner or youthful offender. And the second, I think it's either in Judge Wexler or Judge Fahey, I think is the other judge, mm. pointed out that w one of the things we've done with these um, uh, 123A hearings is to com comply with very tight time frames. And would I be correct in understanding that it's the Commonwealth's position that if somebody is in Bridgewater having completed their criminal sentence, so now they are there for mental mm -hmm. illness, that the common, it could be 10, 20 or more years before the Commonwealth sought to have them um, uh, committed under 123A? Yes, Your Honor. First, as to the language referring to prisoner repeatedly within the statute, Chapter 125, Section 1M explicitly defines prisoner not only as a committed offender, but also as any other person that is placed in a correctional facility of the Commonwealth in accordance with the law. Bridgewater State Hospital is explicitly designated part of the Bridgewater Correctional Institution um, by Chapter 125, Section 18. So this, this, so this statute would not apply, as you've interpreted it, to individuals who might be confined at other mental facilities, Correct. only Bridgewater. Right, not to facilities run by the Department of Mental Health, because a prisoner is somebody held in a um, correctional facility. MCI Bridgewater is a correctional facility of the Commonwealth, and Bridgewater State Hospital is part of MCI Bridgewater. Even though, <clears throat> even though they would be someone committed to under 123, 
uh, seven and eight might be committed to Bridgewater, they might be committed to another mental health facility as well. Same circumstances, right? Same circumstances. They are committed as mentally ill and dangerous to themselves or others. They don't all get committed to Bridgewater. No, they don't. Only if a determination is made that strict security is required in order to avoid. Correct. So that's the trigger that, that you say makes those eligible for SDP treatment, but not similarly situated people who might be committed to another hospital. It's two things, Your Honor. One is the fact that Bridgewater State Hospital is a correctional facility and people held there are prisoners under the law. The second is the fact that the respondents here were held in Bridgewater con following a continuous period of confinement which began with their criminal terms. And this would also respond to Chief Justice Marshall's earlier question regarding the timing. And that is, it's, the purposes <coughs> of Chapter 123A are to protect the public from dangerous sexual offenders who are about to be released into society and also to treat the respondents. Let, let me back for up just for a minute about the hospital issue. I isn't Bridgewater a correctional facility and a hospital? Is, doesn't it wear two hats? It is a hospital which is, yes, it's part of, the, of a correctional so, so facility. So shouldn't we be looking at why the person is at the hospital, whether the person is there uh, essentially solely for hospital purposes or whether the person is a prisoner who is there under sentence uh, to, to obtain hospital treatment? Well, if a person is someone who is, if a person is also a prisoner in the sense that they are serving their criminal term at the same time and so they're held under 123 section 18, then I think there would be no question, and I don't think that the respondents yeah, the, here these, or the judges these, would disagree these, that. These people weren't prisoners. Correct. They're well, not. They were just there, as Judge Spina alludes to, in their mental health capacity. They were not serving their criminal terms, but it's the Commonwealth's position that they were prisoners under the law as those terms are defined. Isn't your but, position um, supported by the fact that the statute uses the word confined in addition to incarcerated? And if um, the petitioner's position were adopted, the word confined would be superfluous because someone who's incarcerated is obviously confined. So we, we have to believe that the legislature meant something by confined, therefore they must have meant something other than someone incarcerated to, for a penal sentence. Yes, Your Honor, it is supported by that, that the judge's reading would make the term confined superfluous, and it would also read out of the statute the Commonwealth's ability to petition to commit people who have been found incompetent to stand trial. No, it wouldn't. It really reads that out. There's a special provision for that in this statute, specifically dealing with that. That's not read out. Well, it is, Your Honor, in the, ca in the fact that the judges determined that the Commonwealth had no jurisdiction to petition to commit people who were not serving criminal terms. Unless the, the statute, statute specifically provides it. Doesn't the statute I mean, specifically provide it for those? The statute specifically provides it, and those people are clearly confined. There is still a meaning to the word confined without necessarily including this category of, uh, of person. But the statute in using the term confined does not draw any distinction, does not only say people who are confined because they have been found incompetent to stand trial. It simply says that people who are either incarcerated, confined, or committed to DYS may be committed in certain circumstances and then as a separate matter, it defines people who are potentially subject to commitment as sexually dangerous people as those who have been found incompetent to stand trial on a sexual offense and then meet other standards. So it's the well, Commonwealth's what, what position your, that that... What is your view of the standard of construction, the rule of construction we should use here? Because the stakes are so high, would it not be a... I mean, you know, in a in substance if these people get you know, lifetime registration, all that kind of stuff. Should we use more or less a criminal statute construction, which requires all ambiguities to be resolved against you? Or do, are we in the context of pure civil statutes where, you know, you try to ascertain the purpose and what the legislature <coughs> meant and all that rigmarole that we usually put in the opinions? I think that the, that the terms... The, the rules of construction require that the terms be 
construed according to their common usage, and that the term confined under any definition covers the circumstances of the respondents here. And also that we should look at the purpose of the statute, which I had started to say is the protection of the public when a serious sexual offender is about to be released. And for that reason, in Commonwealth versus Shedlock, a case decided by the appeals court on which this court declined further appellate review, the appeals court held that despite this court's decision in Commonwealth versus McLeod, in which the court had held that the Commonwealth may only petition to commit someone then serving a sentence for a sexual offense, that the Commonwealth could nevertheless petition to commit someone serving a sentence for a non-sexual offense is on the heels. Shedlock is not entirely appropriate because you, there's no question that you had somebody who was serving a sentence, correct? Someone was serving a sentence, but they were serving a sentence for a non-sexual offense. And what the court in Shedlock, what, it's, in Shedlock, it seemed to me that you, you, and I think one of the reasons the appeal <coughs> court gave is that you would have somebody who was serving a so-called sexual offense crime, and if you go to your correct articulation, at least of one of the purposes of the statute, they then are serving another sentence, but they are about to be a non-sexual offense crime they are about to be released from serving their sentence, which included their sexual offense, into the community. Right. And what so it was just an – viewed one way, it was an oddity of the, the timing of what portion of the sentence they were serving immediately before they were released into the community. Yes, but what the court held there was that – Although this court had construed Chapter 123A to require that the person be serving a sexual offense conviction at the time the petition was filed, that in the case of Mr. Shedlock and others who then were serving a non-sexual offense conviction before their release was imminent, it would not make sense to require the Commonwealth to file the petition near the technical end of the sexual offense conviction because the public does not need to be protected from someone who will continue to be confined potentially for years. And in addition to that, this court has noted that the focus of the statute is the person's mental state near the time that they will be released from confinement into society. And in these cases, where the respondents may continue to be held for years, the Commonwealth would be required to file their petition. There would be no meaningful assessment of the respondents' mental state at the crucial time before they would be released. In all likelihood, the, the proceedings under 123A would have to be repeated again and again. Either that or there would be no ability to what, meet the stringent time standards. What do you do with the language standards. in the Knapp and Bruno cases that talk about a fairly heavy liberty interest that's at stake here? What do you do with that? Um, I when would argue that... you've got a statute that's so, in my opinion, mushy. I believe that the, the liberty interests of the respondents are still strongly protected by this statute, even under the Commonwealth's interpretation of it. There's still a very compelling governmental interest, and the class of people who are subject to potential commitment is still very limited. And in addition to that, the court noted recently in Commonwealth versus Nieves that the adversarial and very detailed and lengthy process by which someone is committed under 123A really minimizes the risk that somebody will be erroneously committed. So what's, what's the problem with <clears> – why is the Commonwealth disadvantaged? Someone is about to complete their prison sentence. Maybe they've been committed under uh, Section 18, 123, Section 18. Um, why can't the Commonwealth just move as it ordinarily would for a 123A sexually you know, SDP commitment? Why do they have to wait to allow this other civil – why can't they just proceed? They're not, you're not in a bind, are you? Why are you in a bind? Well, the first issue is in many cases the DA's office will not receive notice. In the Gillis case, the Commonwealth was not notified – until two and a well, half that's a years. Well, that's a problem, but that's not the law's problem. That's somebody else's problem. Somebody's well, supposed to notify you, aren't they? Well, no, it is in the sense that Section 12A only requires an agency with jurisdiction to notify the Commonwealth upon the imminent release 
of the person. From, from the sentence, isn't it the sentence? released from the sentence, though, isn't it? Well, it does not say that. It just says upon their release. And in Commonwealth versus Shedlock, the appeals court interpreted that word release to mean their release from all confinement or custody. But so that's it's just reasonable. procedural, and, and you could work with the <clears throat> releasing authorities to get notice when someone is about to be released from a criminal sentence to a civil commitment. But what would you do as a practical matter if you got the notice and someone is committed, would, you, would they then be... Well, would they be, then be entitled to a petition for discharge every year? I mean, would you have a proceeding every year? I'm not quite clear how it would work out. Right. Well, Your Honor, yes. In future cases, we could try to ensure that the Department of Correction would notify us upon the term expiration of a criminal term. But as you noted, there would be difficulties. And as I had stated what, what, earlier, what, what, what? because the, <clears throat> if the person is civilly committed to Bridgewater State Hospital under Chapter 123, and their release is not imminent, then the, the examination under 123A is not going to be made at the crucial time when the person is going to be released into society. Well, well no, but you, if they're committed under 123A, then I assume the commitment under 123 is wiped out. It no longer applies, right? Well, I don't know why that would be so, Your Honor. They're both court orders of commitment, and why one would trump the other if the person is committed to Bridgewater State Hospital. Under 123A, from one day to, to, to life, right? No, under 123. On 123A. Well, no, but I'm saying your commitment under 123A would certainly take precedence over any 123 commitment, wouldn't it? I don't know why that would be so, if they're both court orders of commitment. Right, but the 123 commitment is very... Uh, limited in yeah. time, and you know, quite frankly, the amount of time it takes to process a 123A, it will get you to the end of that period of commitment, or approximately to it before you're trying the case. Sometimes well beyond it. Um, it does um, not seem to me to be a problem that once the Commonwealth, if the Commonwealth prevails on 123A, the remaining 123 commitment will just expire on its own terms, and there will be no need to pursue or defend a, a, um, a renewal of it. Mr. Unless, Zamo, just yes. before you answer, the lights are going to be dimmed. It's not because of your answer, so you may answer, but I didn't <laughs> want you to be startled, so go ahead. Uh. Okay. I just, uh, unless members, staff of the Department of Correction sought further commitment, which they did in this case separate from the District Attorney's Office, the, mem the staff of the Department of Correction at Bridgewater State Hospital make their own determinations about whether they believe that respondents committed under Chapter 123 should be, sh their commitments should be extended under Section 7 and 8, and they make those determinations separate from the district attorneys who are making their determinations as to whether to proceed under 123A. But, but how, how would this, the, the system even work? You're, you would, you're entitled to notice six months before the person is going to be released, right? Yes. You get a civil commitment hearing every year for a person who's committed under Chapter 123. Nobody knows whether they're going to be released until the day of the hearing. Or after. Well, until the person or, makes or, a until, or Yeah, the until the a judge makes a decision that you can be released. And, and then the judge makes the decision saying you're no longer mentally ill and a danger to society. I'm opening the door. Do you continue to hold that person for another six months? When does the notice go from the, the, the superintendent of the institution to the district attorney? Well, Your Honor, that would be a decision for the Department of Correction. What they did in this case was, I believe that they made a determination, particularly in Mr. Gillis's case, that they were not going to seek a renewal. And so they knew several months before the 123 order of commitment would expire that his release would be imminent. It's similar to the case of but, but, when well, people then take, are... But, but take my hypothetical, where they don't decide, they don't make the decision that they're going to petition. And the, and the, but the, the, the inmate or the, uh, the, the patient mm -hmm. requests a hearing, uh, gets the hearing, it's fought tooth and nail, and the judge says, this person's not mentally ill anymore. I'm going to let him out. How do you get notice in a case like that under 123A? Well, there are a couple of things. Either the notice would just come at very late, which does sometimes happen when people are awarded jail credits that are unexpected, and so we're given very short notice, not the six-month notice. Or the other thing um, 
that sometimes happens is like, for instance, in cases where a person is in prison and they're up for parole. We will be notified by the parole board that a person has a certain parole eligibility date and that they will be coming before the parole board. Now, they're not making a prediction as to whether or not the person will actually be paroled, and so we're not sure whether they will be released, but they give the district attorney's office advance notice of the parole eligibility date so that the district attorney has an opportunity to do an investigation into whether they might seek um, to petition under 123A. May I ask another question? I'm sorry, were you going to ask a question? I have a question as well. I was about to thank Ms. Lizard. Well, so I'd like to ask a question. more questions coming. Let me, let me see if I understand how the statute would work under your interpretation. Let's assume someone finishes their prison sentence, has long since been released, but then, because of mental illness, is committed and is deemed to be dangerous to himself and to others and maybe even requiring some strict security, so ultimately is committed under 123 to Bridgewater State Hospital. Um, at that point, could you then petition under 123A? No, I don't believe so. It's Why our, not? Because it's, it's our position that the interpretation of the statute that the Commonwealth is putting forth is also um, motivated by the underlying case law, this Court's determinations in McLeod and also Shedlock, and the purposes of the statute. So that it's because of the continuous period of commitment and but the fact be that this would be the but first. But they would be confined, as you've described it, in, and they'd be a prisoner, as you've described it, because they'd be at Bridgewater, not at some other mental <clears throat> institution. Um, why wouldn't it apply? And they're about, they might be released under a 123 commitment at any point in time when their annual hearing comes up. So why wouldn't it apply? Because when, when the court is looking to interpret the meaning of a statute, it also looks to the purposes to be served by the statute and the underlying case law interpreting the statute. The Commonwealth's position is that, that those purposes and the case law um, justify its position that the statute should be construed to allow it to petition for commitment in this. Because the first practicable moment that the Commonwealth could have petitioned for commitment in these circumstances is upon the release from the continuous period of confinement, like in Shedlock, whereas in your scenario, the Commonwealth could have petitioned for commitment before the person was released from their confinement. Here, there was no release, and it's the release that triggers the agency with jurisdiction giving notice and then the Commonwealth's filing of the 123A petition. Thank you. Um, I have a practical question, and you may not know the answer, but you've now worked on this type of case for two counties. Do you have any idea of the number of persons at any given time who are, sub who are being committed across the state Under one civilly as a con after, continuously after a period of uh, criminal confinement has ended? I mean, I, is, are we dealing with hundreds, thousands, or ten? I don't. I can only say that, as far as I know, these are the only two cases in which um, 123A commitment was sought in those circumstances. And I only know of one other case in which 123A commitment was sought against someone held at Bridgewater State Hospital who was confined after being found incompetent to stand trial. And that case is pending in the appeals court on um, an interlocutory appeal after a hearing under Section 15 of 123. So at least as far as you know, the, there are just a few people to whom this would apply at or, any given time. Or probably, because in all likelihood, if there were more, then more 123A petitions would have been filed. Thank you, Mr. Zamo. Thank you. Mr. You may proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Day on behalf of the appellee, uh, Richard Gillis. Uh, Mr. Gillis would respectfully contend that the Commonwealth's argument uh, improperly and unreasonably expands the scope of Chapter 123A. Uh, in, answer, in, in response to Justice Greeney's inquiry, uh, this court in McLeod said that when a fundamental right is at issue, that this court will, uh, will scrutinize the statute in a more exacting in a more strict uh, sense than uh, when, when, when a fundamental well, yeah, right is not an issue. And that's been echoed in Bruno and in Knapp. 
correct? It has, Your Honor. It has, so yes, Your Honor. To go the Commonwealth's direction, we've got to back away, it seems to me, from, you know, these statutes would have to be construed very strictly. I, I would concur, Your Honor. Um, if I we, know you would. Mr. Day, if we agree <laughs> with you, um, is that inconsistent with Shedlock? No, it's not, Your Honor. Shedlock is factually uh, an opposite because Shedlock, again, involved a situation in which we had a respondent who was serving uh, uh, one long prison sentence, if you will, that was divided into a, a sexual offender portion, immediately followed by a non-sexual offender portion. But the, the, but the primary issue, the relevant issue, is that at all times the respondent was under a term of imprisonment, a, a term of incarceration. In this particular case, uh, Mr. Gillis wasn't even doing a prison sentence at any time that's relevant to these proceedings for a sexual offense. That was back in the 1990s. He was released, was reincarcerated for a non-sexual offense, in 1999 that expired in December of 2001. At that time, at that point, Your Honor, once, once his prison term expired in December of 2001, the Shedlock analogy ends because at this time we don't have a person who's still serving a prison sentence. At this time, we have a, a mental health patient. But he's confined and he's a prisoner, at least as the statute, if you look very carefully at because he's at Bridgewater State Hospital, because Bridgewater State Hospital is, is deemed to be a part of the MCI Bridgewater, because MCI Bridgewater is a correctional facility, because anyone lawfully confined in a correctional facility is a prisoner. If you follow that whole line, your client is confined and he's a prisoner. Your Honor, with all due respect, I, would, I understand that argument, but I would submit that it does require a little bit of a straining of the, the statutory language. I understand that Chapter 125, Section 1M does define a prisoner as one of two things, a committed offender. He clearly is not that because a committed offender is defined as a person convicted of a crime and committed mm -hmm. for that crime. And then we have the other general language, which is a such other person as is placed in custody in a correctional facility in accordance with law. I would respectfully submit that once his prison term expired and he was facing no open criminal charges, it's inappropriate to, to, des to designate him as in custody. He was, in, he was hospitalized. Mm -hmm. Granted, it was at Bridgewater State Hospital, but he was under a civil commitment order, Section 7 and 8, hospitalized, just like a person could be involuntarily hospitalized at Pembroke Hospital. Well, well, what, about a, uh, what, what happens to a, a defendant who is found not competent to stand trial? He's hop hospitalized under Chapter 123, I think it's Section 16, okay. um, and uh, he's all of a sudden he's now ready to stand trial, um, or, or uh, he's been there for such a long period of time that he's going to be released. Uh, is, be, uh, is, 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 is that an appropriate uh, custody situation for purposes of determining whether Chapter 123A should apply? It may very well be, Your Honor, and the statute speaks to that directly. Uh, yeah. And I think that is where the statute goes when it's referring to confinement. Someone under those circumstances who, ha who does have open criminal charges pending against them and is being confined pending the resolution of those charges under your scenario because he's been deemed incompetent to stand trial. So he's not incarcerated, really, but he is confined pending a determination as to what his open criminal matter would be. But again, respectfully, I would submit in this case, we don't have that because we have a guy who's finished. He had, he's under no open charges or any term of incarceration. He's a mental health patient at this point. If the legislature had intended to cover or to encompass a person in this situation, what words would you say they should have used? Uh, Your Honor, they could have defined agency with jurisdiction to include someone, or excuse me, an agency that has authority over a person who's subject to a civil mental health commitment. Uh, they could have, uh, rather than using just a phrase, regardless of the reason for the incarceration, confinement, or youth commitment, they could have uh, expanded that to include uh, mental health patients who are under civil commitment to Bridgewater State Hospital. They, Your Honor, I would just submit that they could have been more specific in, in how broad they wanted the statute to when go. You look, when you look at all this, you kind of get the impression that they just didn't focus on this problem, and it's not our job to fix it. Your Honor, I, uh, just Judge Fahey was the judge who, who Mr. Gillis had, and in her, in her order, she uh, noted that it seems like this statutory amendment was clearly a response to the McLeod decision, and I, I would respectfully submit that it seems like that as well. Mr. Day, I take it that one of the problems that your client at any rate has is the piece that, that you alluded to in the facts, namely that even if you look at the reason why he was incarcerated, he was not being incarcerated for a, for a so-called sexual offense, correct? Correct, Your Honor. So 
under the Commonwealth theory, anybody who's in Bridgewater under 123, regardless of whether they are there for a sexual offense, can suddenly have 123A apply to them. Yes, sure. So for that reason alone, your client shouldn't be subjected to 123A. I would, I would submit, Your Honor, yes. But for the post-McLeod amendments, he would have never been subjected to a petition to begin with. And then in this particular case, again, given the fact that he's not, he hasn't, since the time he's been most recently held, it's been not for a sexual offense, correct, Your Honor? This may be a situation where we, after the McLeod decision, the legislature told us, well, we intended or now we want to include people who you excluded by the McLeod decision. Now we find that they didn't go, as, or we may conclude that they didn't go as far as they really intended, and they may amend the statute again. Uh, but, but we aren't supposed to fill it for them if they haven't done so completely. Yes, Your Honor. I, mean, I, I think that's uh, what my approach has been as well, that the statute as amended still isn't broad enough to encompass a person in Mr. Gillis's position. I also um, I think other people, other, other justice have, justices have alluded to this, but it seems as though the, the construction that the Commonwealth would, would like to apply could result in an unequal protection situation with people who are confined at, at other state hospitals, not under the jurisdiction of the Department of Corrections, for, for whom the statute would not apply, and, and, you know, but for the fact that they happen to be living in the eastern part of the state and end up at Bridgewater State Hospital, uh, those people would end up being uh, subject to Chapter 123A. Yes, Your Honor. I would submit that the Commonwealth's position would require uh, or would allow whether a person is going to be subjected to a lifetime commitment petition under 123A while they're serving a civil commitment under Sections 7 and 8, I would submit that the Commonwealth's position would make that exposure totally dependent upon where the respondent is being uh, hospitalized. And I would submit that may very well create a, an unequal protection uh, problem. Again, as I alluded to a moment ago, we could have someone at Pembroke Hospital, Taunton State Hospital, somewhere out in the western part of the state, under the same, excuse me, the same statutory provisions that Mr. Gillis is being held under, which is Sections 7 and 8, not subjected to an STP petition, but, but for the reason, or but, but for the circumstance that Mr. Gillis is at Bridgewater State Hospital, he is subjected. And I, I would submit that that may very well create an un unequal protection problem. Thank you, Mr. Day. Thank you. And you, you have, if you want anything else, I didn't mean to cut you off, but. Uh, no, Your Honor, I'm fine. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hirsch. Thank you. 